Hi, everybody. My name is Phil Chan, and I'm the co-founder of Final Bow for Yellowface. Welcome to What's the Tea, a daily conversation with dancers of Asian descent during the month of May for Asian Pacific Heritage Month to highlight the achievements and experiences of Asians in dance. Today, we're chatting with an old friend of mine, Alice Shi, who's with Birmingham Royal Ballet, who is also um, raising money for a special charity today, if you want to share with, uh, with everybody who's tuning in. Yeah, so um, the charity is Families for Children. Great, thank you. Welcome, Alice. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so first of all, I think we should tell everybody um, a little bit about how we met. Um, uh, it was probably about 10 years ago, and it was a Nutcracker, and Alice was dancing the Snow Queen, and she was doing like a series of really tricky turns, if I recall. And it was like quite a slippery stage because I remember they had the little foam bubbles. Remember that? It was like, um, and I just remember you like had a little slip at the end and uh, like um, you were not as quiet. Uh, maybe not have mastered that yet as a dancer. Um, but I, I, I don't think I've still mastered that. I feel like it's a, like, like a biscuit ballerina moment if we can find the video. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so you're at Birmingham Royal Ballet now. Well, um, you know, so, so tell me, how have you been, um, you know, professionally? How's it going? You just did some Nutcracker debuts this past season. Yeah, I am. Um, so I've been with BRB for about eight years now, um, which is crazy because it's just gone by so fast. And um, this year, I've, it's been an amazing year for me. Um, I did the Queen of the Willies debut in the fall. And then I did Sugar Plum over Christmas. And then I also got to do um, Odette Odile for our um, Swan Lake Dreams performances, um, which is basically they bring in children from all across the UK to do Swan Lake on the stage with us. Um, so that was a really exciting opportunity as well. Very cool. And yeah. so what are you... Um... What are you missing right now in this sort of crazy time? What what would you be dancing? What what would you be like to, to be dancing? Well, you know, um, I think, well, right now we are supposed to be rehearsing for um, our kind of summer season. So we were supposed to be doing Dante Sonata at the Opera House. Um, we were supposed to be doing, um, oh, I can't even remember. We we're supposed to be doing Carlos's Don Q in the summer, as well as a really fantastic triple bill um, at Sadler's Wells. Um, so it's a bit disappointing. There are some really exciting choreographers we were going to be working with and we we're going to be creating a new um, piece by Daniela Cardin, um, which has unfortunately had to be postponed. Um, in terms of what I'm missing, I think what I'm missing the most is actually my kind of ability to be with my friends and my colleagues and I'm really missing the kind of camaraderie and the, you know, conversations, crazy dressing room conversations we have, but, you know, two minutes before class in the dressing room and, you know, like just in rehearsals, the kind of sharing and, and real, yeah, just the laughs and the enjoyment that I get from seeing all my friends. Now, now tell me, when did you, you start your dance training? You from Toronto originally? Yep. Yeah. Born and raised. Um, I started, so I mean, I guess like all little girls, I started really young, you know, like I think I was about three and my aunt actually put me in lessons um, because at the time my parents owned a restaurant, so they were like crazy busy. Um, so I was raised by um, my extended family. Um, and so my aunt, yeah, asked my mom one day, she put me in ballet lessons and my mom was really too busy to pay any attention and was like, yeah, do whatever you want. And here we are. I think she might regret that a little bit now. Oh, and um, when did you, when did it really connect for you to that this could be a professional career and not just, you know, something fun for you to do? You know, it's funny because I think, and I say this all the time, like, I don't think I ever, there was never a moment where I kind of like consciously made the choice, like, I'm going to be a dancer. It just kind of, I enjoyed it so much that there was never really a thought in my head that. I wanted to do something else. I mean, of course, as a child, you kind of always explore, you know, you I want to be an astronaut or, you know, space cowboy or whatever. Um, but I think in myself, I always knew like ballet was it. That was like my focus, my passion, my energy, everything. So I think yeah. it just, yeah. Now tell me a little bit about your, your um, 
ethnic and your cult cultural heritage and to what degree are you personally connected to it? Yeah, so I am um, half Chinese and half Caucasian, I suppose. Um, my dad is um, Chinese. He was born in Hong Kong um, and he immigrated to Canada with his family when he was about 10 or 11 years old. Um, so pretty young and um, his, so my grandparents, his parents were from Shanghai um, and they came to Canada because my grandfather is, well, he was a tailor um, and he was, his boss sponsored the family to move to Canada. Um, and then my mom's side is a particularly kind of interesting situation, I would say, in terms of kind of cultural, um, you know, because a lot of people, and you discuss it a lot in your book, how you kind of connect, you know, if your family, like my dad's family, they are Chinese, they're a very Chinese family. My mom's side, you know, my grandmother adopted 28 kids um, from all over the world, and then she also had four children. And I think because of that, I had a very kind of unusual upbringing, and, and definitely in terms of connecting to kind of my cultural heritage, as it were, um, because in a sense, I feel like I didn't necessarily have one specific, you know, it wasn't, I was Chinese and Caucasian. It was like, I, there were so many people of so many different cultures, races, you know, skin colors that were in my life that it didn't, it wasn't really a thing. And I have, you know, so many stories that, and you mention it in your book as well about, um, you know, in, including people in your culture. And that is, you know, it's a way of understanding. And I think I was lucky enough to have that so much throughout my childhood um, that for me, it, it, you know, it's, yeah, it's kind of special. I'm very lucky. And how does that inform your experience as a dance artist now? Like, what do you bring from that into your professional career? You know, I think it's, um, I think a couple things. I think, you know, there's, of course, there's all these things about, you know, hard work and discipline. And, you know, I think that sometimes, like, stereotypically, there can be these things associated with being Asian that, you know, you're very studious and you work really hard and you kind of, um, but I would say that I think that that is something that ballet instills in everybody who does it as well. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing for me, and especially from my mom's side of the family, is just this idea that you have to look and embrace everything and everyone and every, you know, and every role that you do, whether it's whatever ballet it is, whatever culture it comes from, you just have to be open to a new experience and not be afraid or not feel like, oh, because I don't know anything about this, I can't kind of learn about it. You know, I think, I think that's been the biggest thing for me. Um, how do you think the ballet community is doing in terms of race and representation and kind of having these challenging conversations, you know, because as, as the dance community gets more diverse, as we have more people of color joining ballet companies, um, just the, the overall landscape organically is changing. So how do you think we're doing in terms of having this conversation? in the UK versus in Canada or in the United States um, might be different. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that it's really difficult to kind of paint the whole ballet community with one brush because depending on where you are, the situations are so different. Um, I, think, I think there have been a lot of roadblocks um, in terms of not necessarily people's kind of want to engage in this conversation, but I think that there have been other things that maybe have been taking priority for them. I know that in the States, a, a lot of it is funding and the fact that public cuts are constantly being made. I mean, same here in the UK, that they kind of end up pushing this conversation. You know, when you look at senior management teams and stuff, when their time, they only have so much of it. It's like this kind of gets pushed back and back and back in favor of things that maybe more they see as being more immediate. Um, but I think that the more that we continue to kind of knock on the door, say like, hello, like this is a, an issue that needs to be addressed. And while we understand that there are, there are difficulties outside of the realm of just kind of the depictions of race and, and kind of cultural sensitivity, it is still something that needs to be discussed and, and really brought on board. Um, yeah. You know, in terms of how we're doing, I think, 
I mean, of course we can always do better, you know, I mean, I think there's always, there's always there are places that are doing better and places that are, are kind of struggling to catch up, I would say, but I think, yeah. I think everyone can do better. Yeah. Do you have any experiences with um, navigating a challenging racial conversation in the ballet community or um, something that you, you've been challenged by yourself? You know, I, it's kind of sad to say in the sense that when I think about the fact that I, I have to say it like this, that it's kind of sad, but I'm actually lucky enough and I shouldn't have to be lucky enough but I am, that I haven't actually had that many um, kind of difficult conversations. There haven't, you know, I've not really faced that much kind of cultural insensitivity directed toward me or, um, or necessarily the people I work with. I think, um, yeah, I think in that way, I'm very fortunate. I mean, you know, as you mentioned in your book, again, you know, you had um, Georgina who was told to make her makeup look more or less oriental. And that kind of thing. Uh, I've never been exposed to that personally. Um, I would say the one thing that obviously in our company we did have to deal with was, um, don't want to say deal with, but um, when you guys approached the company about the Nutcracker. And I think one of the really interesting things with the way Caroline hand, handled it is after your original meeting in New York, she came to several of our dress answers and came to spoke to us about our personal experience and what we felt um how we felt about it and basically she said you know i was approached and and i want to get your opinions and feedback before i kind of make decisions um and i think that that was a really big thing for her to do i think i think for me a lot of the issues companies face at the moment are our communication i think other time you know and and again you mentioned it in your book when you had your meeting with the dancers of PN, PNB, I believe it was, um, mm -hmm. they felt like they wished that they'd been included sooner. And I think that a lot of the time it is the case that, you know, management are looking to make decisions and, and that you don't always necessarily know how it's going to feel to the people who are actually performing the work, you know? Um, I think that a lot of companies need to be, be more inclusive, not, not necessarily of, of, you know, to frame this right, but you know, including their staff members, the dancers, the people who are really working with these pieces to get their kind of emotional connection to it. Absolutely. Um, so, what what are some what are some other ways besides? Okay, so I think improving conversations and maybe access to training for dancers is probably like one solution. Um, what are what do you think are some other ways that we as a community can do better in terms of like what we're putting on stage? I think a big one is including community in it. I mean, and as you said in your in your book, when you included the the um, kind of Chinese cultural um, committee in with PNB, I think there needs to be more of that. I think engaging the community, it's not saying, you know, we're the ballet company and you are our audience. It's saying actually we can work together to, to create something that's beautiful. Art is something that should be, you know, people should be working together. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something to be not for us to hold and you to view as a separate spectator, but actually it's a community thing. We come together to create something beautiful and I think that acknowledging that if you don't understand, that's absolutely fine. And, and maybe as a person who is Caucasian, you don't understand somebody who is, you know, of Middle Eastern descent or of Asian descent or, you know, but to say that's actually, I don't understand that, but I want to include people who do is I think a really, really important step. And I think at the moment it's, you know, ballet companies are so traditional and I think it can be difficult for them to kind of open their doors. But I think that is the kind of big step that needs to be taken. So, for example, like if you're saying, oh, we want we want to involve in, and include Middle Eastern people, but then we bring them and open our doors for a performance of Corsair. Like, how does that how does that work? Do you know what I mean? So like, yeah. you know, like so. So, uh, you know, our, 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 do we have to look at our repertory? especially the repertory that focuses on other people a little bit differently than say the stuff that is representing ourself, you know, say 
um, you know, like a Giselle, it's sort of a Germanic European story that, you know, is very intertwined with ballet culture or, or maybe like a Russian story, um, you know, uh, are those, are those better to, better to be left on intact or in some way than some of these other ballets? Like, do you know what I mean? That there seems to be like more problems with these other ones and how do we deal yeah. with that? Well, I think, I think it's getting them in sooner. It's not once the production has already kind of at its completion and you're already you know in full like final rehearsals and you've already done all the work and then suddenly you bring somebody in i think it's about including the community right from the beginning so saying yeah. i you know we as a company want to revive le corsair so let's get people in who know that culture to be able to help us make the most you know um real the most kind of you know it's about that whole thing like cultural appropriation and appreciation like how do we appreciate this beautiful culture and intertwine it with our culture of ballet and i think it's it's about when you bring people in you know yeah i'm uh, i'm actually working on a, a corsair version that takes place in atlantic city and it's a miss america beauty pageant instead of a slave bazaar Amazing. and instead of pirates they're like you know gangsters so it's um it's, but it's keeping all of the petty pop choreography. So just showing that there's a way to keep the tradition um, mm -hmm. and keep it historical, but also make it relevant and feel contemporary to people alive today. Cause like, I don't know, like who cares about slave girls? Like, you no, know, European exactly. fantasy, but like how can you make it, how can you make it something? And if it is just flashy dancing, then like, you know, why not a, why not a beauty pageant? So. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, and fun. I think, I think so much like you look at, for example, and I, I, I always think about this. You look at like um, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Exactly. And I just think yeah. like, it's so like, it's, it just shows that you can keep the kind of historical nature of a piece and you can stay true to it, but also while showing there are so many things that you can do, you know, well, just because you, you want to keep it authentic doesn't mean you're trapped within a, such a strict framework, you know? I think it's just so hard because um, like Shakespeare's written down. So there's, um, you know, there's, there's words that you can kind of anchor into tradition. Whereas in dance, it's like, gosh, even where you look and when to breathe, like that might get lost if you don't spell it out for the next generation in that way. Um, or like the secret behind a, a step or a phrase or something. So it's a slightly different process. So I think that that's yeah. why we've may maybe been forced to be a little bit more conservative about like what we change and how we change. But yeah. um, I think the biggest question for me is like, if we're accepting some changes, like legs getting higher, technique moving in different ways, like, you know, even how we costume certain ballets, if we're able to stage some ballets in other time periods, why not the racial ones as well? Definitely, you know? so. definitely. And I think, I think a lot of the kind of I don't want to say trouble, a lot of the kind of, you know, the, the pushback from companies come when you're doing a ballet that's already been created and you're then reviving it. You know, I don't, I think a lot of companies when they're looking into doing new productions, maybe are a bit more um, thoughtful towards the creative process. But when a ballet has already been made, it's like, oh, well, we already have the notations. We already have everything. So we're just going to take that and put it on. And it's yeah. like, actually, you need to consider how it reads in today's society yeah and then that's why maybe like some productions of giselle that are from the 80s still are great and still resonate but like others might not just don't work anymore and so we have to keep thinking about that which is also going to be challenging right now with all of the financial problems that many dance companies are facing so it's going to make this conversation again pushed maybe to the back burner um mm -hmm. you know but um it's a shame though, because I think in a lot of ways, this conversation, and, and I think sometimes what companies maybe miss, not, not to be criticizing, because obviously I'm not in a position where I have to make the tough choices that they do. But I think where sometimes they miss the mark is that these conversations and, and difficulty with kind of audience numbers falling and, and um, you know, generating some income, they're actually not two separate conversations. And I think they're, they kind of, 
merge in a way that, you know, when you look towards like getting audience numbers up, including more young people, a lot of that is about being able to relate. People want to come and see something they can relate to. And if they come to watch a performance and they feel alienated because of how their culture is being represented, that's not going to help with getting more and different audiences in. So I think actually it's like these two conversations about the difficulty with generating income and, you know, how, you know, BAME people or women or anyone is, is represented in ballet are so important that they actually meet and come together. Yeah. What, um, what advice would you have for a young dancer um, who's, I guess, trying to trying to have a, have a career and make something of, of themselves in this, in this field. What advice would you have for them right now? The advice I would have right now, um, my fiance would say, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a personal trainer. He, uh, he's an SNC coach. Don't call him a personal okay. trainer. He'll, uh, Sorry, yeah, my, my apologies. he'll get offended. <laughs> No, I mean, but you know, he, that comes from somebody who had a fantastic career and has now moved on to a second fantastic career. Um, I think the, I think what I would say for a lot of individuals coming from kind of my own personal experience is um, just, you know, to enjoy it, do it because you love it. And as amazing as social media is and as amazing as, you know, how much Kind of connectivity there is now like globally in terms of you can see all these amazing people try as much as you can not to get caught up in it and try not you know you see videos of somebody doing these amazing pirouettes or getting their legs up to their ears but i think for me at the end of the day that isn't necessarily what the essence of ballet actually is and i think that you lose a lot by not watching you know full performances and not going to the theater and experiencing and obviously right now with this pandemic we can't but even, you know, looking on YouTube, I think a lot of young people, and certainly I was the same, you know, you look at these amazing stars like Osipova and Misty Copeland, and of course you would dream and aspire to become them. But I think as much as anything else, you shouldn't, you know, a lot of dancers don't make it into companies at all. So to even be court of ballet is an incredible achievement and it doesn't lessen your work and your experience and your contribution to ballet to become that. And I think that you can always learn from not just the amazing principal, but everybody, everybody on the sides, you can see everybody's artistry and how everybody contribute to a full performance rather than just that amazing pirouette. Although to be fair, I did do pirouettes on YouTube. So, you know, <laughs> hypocrite. Whiz, whiz kid, whiz kid over here. <laughs> um, okay. I, I'm going to close this out with a couple just flash questions. So yeah. these just like short answers. Okay, you okay. ready? Totally yeah. on the fly, unprepared. Um, what is your favorite um, like show day breakfast? My favorite, oh, um, pancakes with maple pancakes. syrup. Okay. Um, least favorite bar exercise? Adage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> least, least favorite center? Adage. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, favorite summer intensive? ABT. ABT New uh, York. A performance that changed your life? Um, oh my gosh. I guess my debut of Sugar Plum, although, although maybe a close second to that would be the time that a horse pooed on stage and then one of the dancers kicked it and it hit one of the other girls. That was really funny. <laughs> What ballet was that in? Female Garde. Oh, good. Um, least favorite costume? Um, the waltz costumes from Swan Lake, Act One. What, 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 what? All of it. There's, they, I think, literally, I think they were made in, like, gotta be at least 30 years ago, maybe even closer to, like, 40. Literally can't wash them. The fabric is, like, a, like, drapes, and they're like up to here, long sleeves, long dress, hideous. You sweat so much. Post-show guilty pleasure. Chocolate. What kind? Oh, uh, what, what, whatever I can get my hands on. Um, if you weren't a dancer, what would you be doing? I think I would probably be a lawyer. 
Ooh, why? Because I really quite enjoy it. Um, I have a friend actually who's studying law at the moment and he does, you know, talk to us a bit. And sometimes I'm like, I find myself kind of drifting off halfway through what he says, and then 15 minutes later coming back. But um, yeah, I've done a couple, I <laughs> know, it's terrible. I shouldn't let him watch this. <laughs> um, I've done a couple law courses in my degree and I really enjoyed them. So I think, All right. yeah. Maybe act two. Maybe, you never know. Yeah. Um, best thing about being a dancer? Um, the community, the, the feeling of being in such a kind of tight knit and supportive community in terms of friends, colleagues, and you know, I mean, like we've known each other for 10 years. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I don't think you get that with a lot of other, with a lot of other jobs. Yeah, certainly true. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about what you are, would like, if there's anyone still tuning in, hopefully, <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what you are raising money for today, if people want to just, um, feeling generous and uh, we might have some crazy rituations tuning in, um, how, would, how would they be able to help? So um, my family, I mentioned that my grandmother had adopted 28 children. Um, so my family now run a children's home. Um, there's one in India and one in Bangladesh. Um, they care for over 450 children, adults um, who have severe disabilities and, you know, struggle, struggle to kind of be able to cope with normal life. Um, and at the moment, the cost of food and, and staff is extremely expensive. Um, and the shutdown, the lockdown in India is really um, difficult to, to keep these, these vulnerable people, um, you know, in a position where they are, you know, safe and healthy and, and kind of protected. So um, really anything, I know it's a difficult time for everybody, but if anybody has anything that they could um, donate, it would be a massive help. The charity is Families for Children. Um, so you can find them on Instagram at families.for.children. Um, and then if you would like to donate, then it would be familiesforchildren.ca. There's um, a Canada and then a US PayPal as well. So. Okay. Well, thank you for letting us know about that. Um, thank you again, Alice, for sharing your stories with us. Um, and thank you all of you for tuning in. Uh, make sure to check out our Instagram page, Instagram, Instagram page right now for the reveal of who tomorrow's dancer chat will be with. Uh, and tune in tomorrow at noon for our next conversation. Thank you, Alice. Bye, everybody. Thank you.